What's going on, guys? Welcome to Hit Talks, baseball's mental performance podcast. I'm your host, Vic Ferrante. In this episode, I have a conversation with Eddie Saucedo, who is a current ball player, only 18 years old, with a tremendous passion for learning about the mental side of the game and host of Thought Force podcast. You could also find him on Instagram under the same handle. This podcast will be broken into three separate segments, so please be sure to tune in for part two and part three in the coming weeks. So without further ado, here is part two of my conversation with Eddie Saucedo. Controlling the controllables. I would focus so much on a bad pitch or a bad call, um, a bad at bat, a bad, a guy makes a, I hit a ball in the gap, a guy makes a diving catch, I'm upset. Hey, what are you going to do? There, there, there's another guy on the, there's, you know, nine other guys or eight other guys out there on the field to understand that that's just part of the game and be happy that you barreled up a ball and move on and then become a base runner. That's the other thing too. We, we talk about it so much about like our performance as a hitter, but there's, it's such a small part of the game. There's different components of the game. When you're in the box, you're a hitter. As soon as you make contact, you're a base runner and you need to start thinking like a base runner. You know, the third out is made. Now you need to think right. like a defender. Exactly. And if you are thinking like a base runner and a defender, you're not thinking about your poor performance at the plate, which is there for exactly. keeping you present and keeping you uh, more focused and then not harping on the negative. One thing that you touched on that was huge that, that uh, like you said, I talk about a lot is controlling the controllables. And for me, um, Games have become really, really fun for me lately because it almost becomes like the games are a reward and a, and a kind of a prize for all the training I've put in. So it, it just becomes a let me trust everything I've done and let me just go have fun. And, and this, this is really like the, the prize after all the hard work that I've done. That It becomes a trusting mode and it becomes a – just focus on what you can control and the results will come because before it used to be, Oh man, I need to get at least two hits today or I, I can't make any errors in the field. But all those thoughts have are far, like don't even come close to what I'm thinking about in the game. It becomes everything I can control. So for example, for me as a catcher, I'll, when I, uh, when the pitcher is coming to me, I uh, relax my glove down. So I think about exhaling and kind of blowing my glove down as the pitch, as the pitcher starts coming forward. And as long as I can blow my glove down every time the pitcher comes forward, that's it. That's all I'm thinking about. And my body naturally will catch the ball, frame the ball. When he, when the runner steals, I'm right there. I'm ready. It, and that exhale kind of has me in that relaxed state. And so doing that puts me in a really good spot to do everything I want to do. Block, uh, receive, throw. And that's all I'm thinking about. I'm not thinking about how many pass balls I had the game before, how many pass balls I had the inning before. I'm not thinking about anything. All it, all it is is blow the glove down when this pitch is coming. That's it. And, like, that's for me defensively. And then offensively, it changes more with each pitcher and the approach with everything. But I make sure my approach is something I can really control. And so I'll judge my at-bat, not based off if I got a hit or not, but more off of the decisions I made, the, the pitches I swung at, um, and if I was on time, how relaxed I was, things like that that are in my control um, are really how I evaluate my at-bats. It doesn't become, oh, I'm not on time, I'm not relaxed, and just got really lucky, but that's a bad day for me on the field. It doesn't really yeah. matter. Um, what it looks like in the box score because I know in the long term, if everything I'm controlling, I'm doing really well, I'll be in a really good spot by the time the season's done uh, compared to if I'm just going up and down with whether I got lucky or not, found a few holes, but wasn't really doing the things I can control really well. Yeah. You're it's keeping you, keeping you in the moment, keeping you focused on the process um, and seeing the end game, knowing that if I do these little things now and they, they're not sexy things, they don't sound right. sexy. You're not talking about hitting home runs. It's like, if I do these little things now at the end of the year, my collective, my whole, you know, all the work that I've put in every game, every rep, every pitch, then it's going to equal some good results mm -hmm. and trusting that rather than saying, I want my results now. 
Like, exactly. That, and I think that kind of goes hand in hand, like with that, like the whole mentality of like instant gratification. Like I wanted to go out there and play a game. I wanted the results that I wanted right then. But mm-hmm. that's not how baseball works. And that's right. not how life works. Like you have to put it, and it may happen. Sometimes it happens. You go out the first game, oh, you're just on fire. Then you're on top of the world. And then sure enough, you know, a couple of games later, <laughs> you struggle and then you kind of, you know, you take a nosedive into a slump. Exactly. No, I mean, that's, that's one thing that's huge for me is controlling what I can control because yeah. the moment you control what you control, you liberate yourself from all the restrictions you had mm-hmm. when you were all results oriented. Because if you really think about it, I mean, baseball's a hard enough game to where if you are going up and down, if you know, and, and basing your confidence based on how fast the other team's outfielder is really, I mean, it, it, that's really what it can come down to. If you hit a good line drive and that center fielder runs a six, seven, sixty, and dives and catches your ball, your confidence goes down. But if the outfielder is a six, nine, sixty, and goes right by him, all your confidence is through. If like, how is that? How does that make any sense? You're you know, being it, dragged it along. Right, exactly. You're being dra- your emotional roller coaster, yeah. You become a prisoner of yes. other things that are outside of your control. And I think that's a really, that's a bad spot to be in, especially as you start to go up at levels, whether it's high school, college, professional, those things, the, the talent starts to increase and mm-hmm. the amount of times you get lucky starts to decrease. And I mean, if you're really basing your confidence off of how lucky you are you have no choice but to have your confidence go down as your level increases yep absolutely and that was part of it making the transition into professional baseball um expecting to have to hit 390 like i did in college Mm -hmm. Uh, probably not gonna hit 390 i mean (laughs) some guys do it in the minor leagues um but um i certainly did not and it was a, I mean, it was a huge adjustment because I mean, guys are balls like a blur, you know, I, I was always a good, good at hitting velocity, but it was something different when you get into pro ball, the way the ball comes out of the hand, um, the effortless, um, yep. uh, zip that guys had, it was like, it was like night and day from like college, like facing a kid in college that threw low nineties and we face them every now and then it was a big difference for whatever reason. Um, when you got into pro ball, plus you see every pitcher is throwing low nineties right. and high nineties. Um, but yeah, again, it's just like that, the unrealistic expectations. Um, and then the pressure mm-hmm. going back to like what you were saying about just that, well, baseball is just baseball. Like, and I've always, dis- I've always used to believe the thought, you know, like, you know, it's like a good slogan and it's a good t-shirt or a bumper sticker. Baseball is life but there's kind of a problem with that. Like we were saying, like if you really live by that, it can be something that's very, that you're very passionate about in life. But if you start to think that it is life, then you're potentially on a road where it's a bad place to be in my opinion. Yeah, exactly. Because there's that pressure because Mm -hmm. if I fail in baseball, then am I a failure in life? Mm -hmm. And it's like, it's, it's totally uh, crazy to think that way. And I, I, I thought that way. Yeah. Um, it was kind of, I grew up in a negative environment and I was, ca- I was actually called a failure because mm-hmm. I didn't make it to the major leagues that I didn't do one of the hardest things you could possibly do in all of sports right. you know, or at least just in the baseball world, mm-hmm. like the 1% of the 1% of probably the 1%. <laughs> yeah. And, and so I, that's why I was kind of like in that, that darker place at the end of my career, bitter and just kind of thought I was a failure because baseball was my life. Mm -hmm. For sure. And And yeah, yeah, I mean, one thing, again, kind of going off of that, that I, I also used to really, really believe was it was almost like I was on this quest for perfection. Like everything had to be perfect. Like Every oh, yeah. ball I had to hit had to be barreled up, line drive over the outfielder's head. Every throw I had to make had to be right to the chest. And you just have to come to the. I mean, I mean, there's there's really a balance. You have to be in the middle where it's not like, oh, you threw a ball over the first baseman's head 
20 feet above his head and you're like, oh, I don't care. You just, you can't have that. But at the same time, you have to liberate yourself from that, expe from expecting perfection and not, and being frustrated if it isn't perfect. Because the moment you liberate yourself from that, you would actually be surprised how much closer you are to perfection when you yeah. stop kind of thinking about how perfect you are. Um, yeah, that's, the, that's the really irony one big thing for me was yeah. getting away from that. Right. Exactly. Um, so yeah, that, that's another big thing that I think for me has helped me out is not, not going for perfection, but at the same time, understanding that if I really want to get to be as close to perfect, I have to liberate myself from having and needing to be perfect is, is really knowing that if you really want something, you almost have to reverse it and not believe you actually want it. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Um, I've even said, um, I don't know if I've, maybe I heard this somewhere else and I'm just repeating it, but I kind of like, rather than perfection, focus on progression. Mm -hmm. Just right. as long as you're making progress each and every time, like kind of know that, that perfection is that carrot kind of dangling in front of you that you're never really going to catch it. Um, mm -hmm. you can, it can be your, your, your direction that you're shooting for it. You know, it's like shooting right. for the, like trying to shoot, you know, uh, an arrow at the moon. It's like you're never going to get it. Um, but if you keep going in that direction, um, you're going to get closer. Obviously it doesn't work in <laughs> reality, <laughs> but I mean like <laughs> in terms of obviously going after that per perfect throw, that perfect hit, mm -hmm. as long as you are, continuously making progress in that direction or you're trying to lose weight or you're trying to increase velocity or power forgetting about perfection use it to like okay that's where i want the direction i want to go as a goal and then just focus on keep me making progress because then you get to the you can be in the big leagues you're still not perfect right um you know so i think that that's just another huge huge element that guys um kind of miss you know, for so sure, focused yeah. on that result. For sure. I was listening to a podcast interview with Tony Walters. He's the yeah. catcher with the Colorado Rockies. And one thing that he said was he was asked, I, I, I think this was his answer to the question. I remember he brought this up. I can't remember if this is the exact question, but I think it was uh, the host asked him, Hey, what's, what are your goals for this season? And all he said was just 1% better every day. That's it. And it's the same exact thing is, is progressing. And really, I mean, if you can go to bed each night knowing that you got 1% better, that's, that's good. You know, it, because if you get 1% better and you multiply that by three, four or five years, you're talking about massive, massive improvement. Um, yeah. And I think that that's a big thing. And for me, a way that I can track that is being able to write things down. And I talk about that also a lot is writing things down. I write everything down, you know, for me as a, as a catcher, I'm writing down things I need to work on personally. So hitting, throwing, um, just cues that help me out. So I have my notebook for that. I have my notebook for opposing pitchers. If he's got certain tail, certain, um, off speed, how his off speed acts. Those are, those are things that I'm taking notes on so that when I get back in the box against him, whether it's in playoffs the next year, whenever it is, yeah. I have something to go back to and I don't have to waste one, two, three pitches to remember, oh yeah, he had this kind of movement on his fastball. I could just go to it, see it, and have an idea of what I'm going into before I step in that box so that when I step in, I'm a step ahead and I know what his stuff's looking at. So I'll, I'll take notes on things that I need cues for opposing pitchers that I think a lot of people listening to this can apply to their game. And then for me as a catcher, um, I also like to take notes on opposing hitters, how to pitch them. If they're opening a certain way, if they have trouble hitting certain pitches. Um, so I'll take notes on opposing hitters and then as well, umpires, umpires zones. Um, you know, they're different. You cannot, a lot of pitchers get mad because they don't think it's a uh, strike because it's kind of their perceived zone, but each umpire has their, their own zone that they believe is a strike zone. And it doesn't matter what you think of the strike zone. What matters is the only guy that matters really is the umpire strike zone. And as long as you have a good understanding of that strike zone, 
then you, you can you can be a step ahead of the, the other team because it won't take you one or two innings if you have written that stuff down somewhere and uh, remember it, which for me as a catcher, it's, it's easy because I know the, the umpire's name can write down a little bit of descriptions of what he looks like in case, you know, I write down his name's Tony and I forget, hey, what did Tony look like? I can write, I don't know, had glasses, had these kinds of glasses on, whatever it is. Um, and so I can remember that and I can go into the game knowing, okay, Tony's behind the plate today. He's one inch wide outside, a little narrow inside. I can now work with the pitcher on, hey, this is where the strike zone is. Let's attack these these areas. Um, So we're we're in a good spot. And again, that's another thing that I like to talk about is just being in a good spot. It doesn't mean so we can win. I like saying, so I put myself in a good spot because that, that really takes away a lot of pressure of results and more into... I don't know how to explain it. When, I, when for me, the words being in a good spot say, I'm prepared, I'm as prepared as I can be, and I'm going to trust what I have, and whatever happens, happens. You know, if we lose, I knew I was in a good spot. If we win, I knew I was in a good spot to do it. So those are kind of words that I really like to use. But going off the progress thing, that's really how I track it. And um, I'll sometimes go back and look at notes that I had from months prior and I'll go look where I've come from this Mm -hmm. to now here. If I would have been thinking this, I'd be much worse than I would be than if I'm uh, thinking of the cues that I am now. So that's kind of a way that I track my 1% better each day. Yeah, that's huge. Uh, So then question for like people listening. So when do you actually do all this writing? Do you mid game, uh, do you try to remember it? You probably, does your team, what if your team is not taking a score or at least that type of information, if they're not recording it, how do you get it all down on a paper? Right. I mean, for me, I I think each guy's different. I mean, some guys can put everything in their brain and it just sticks there. They can go to bed um, and, and they have their notebooks by their bed and, Later that night, boom, they write it down. They know it. Um, For me, it, it, I like to free my mind so that, like I said, I can focus on what I have to do. For example, breathing the glove down, stuff like that as a catcher. And as a catcher too, there's a lot of things that go on in my mind during the game and trying to remember, okay, this hitter, he opens up a little bit. Okay. This guy's, this guy's zones a little bit wide. This pitcher has got this kind of like, it's just so much to try to process that for me, I like to write it down in the middle of the game. Um, and the things that I like to write down in the middle of the game would be umpires and opposing hitters. Um, as long as I'm somewhat familiar with the pitchers I'm working with um, and catching, and then my cues are kind of inside me, like, like those, I, I can almost say like, I mean, I have them almost memorized. Like I know my pre-pitch routines, what I'm thinking while I'm breathing before I get to the box, what I'm thinking when I'm in the box, what I'm thinking when I'm behind the plate, those things are almost inside me. So I don't have to refer back to that notebook a whole lot unless if I find, um, hey, this cue works better with certain pitchers or whatever. So if a pitcher's going really, if he's a tall, lanky guy throwing really downhill, I'm going to think, scoop this ball in the center field. So get under it if it's really downhill. And if he's a, a guy with high spin rate, I'm going to think, okay, I'm going to hit the top of this ball, hit it at his feet. And so it, it comes with different kinds of approaches to beat what the game presents you, to beat yeah. what the pitcher gives you. Because if a pitcher's got high spin rate and you're thinking get under this ball, you almost have no shot. Like that. <laughs> I mean, if, if the, the ball seems like it ri- it's rising and the people yeah. that, haven't necessarily like faced something. The moment you face a guy with a high spin rate, you almost swear that ball's going up. Like it, <laughs> it, it that's what it feels like. Oh yeah. And yeah. I mean, you, I think you have to adjust to what the game presents to you, but uh, no, I, I like to take what I can take notes on during the game. I like to take notes yeah. just so I can put it on paper. And I know the paper won't forget what I'm thinking. So I can just go back to whatever I need to be thinking at that point in time. Nice. Nice. Um, yeah. Cause that could be, um, I can imagine that would be kind of like the question kids would have is like, well, how and when, you know, let's say you're catching and cause you gotta, especially as a catcher, cause you gotta be, you gotta 
take your gear off, take your gear back on. Uh, you maybe right. uh, do up. Um, so you can, you know, then you get on base and you're on base for a couple outs and then you mm -hmm. may get a whole inning where you don't even get to sit down uh, in the dugout. Um, right. Obviously you just do your best the next time you get to sit down and keep probably, I would imagine you keep the notes pretty short, kind of short and sweet. Exactly. Uh, keywords that kind of that you know you'll remember what you know going back and looking at it yeah um, for sure and, and one other big thing with taking notes is you're the only guy that needs to understand them like yeah. <laughs> you you don't need to be writing out full essays that your coach yeah. needs like you are the only as long as you know what you're talking about and you know what clicks for you like that's that's all that's the only person you're writing the notebook for so yeah. if i write down three letters and i know exactly what they mean during the game, that's all you need to write down. And then later, yeah, you can maybe fill it in. So maybe later, if you look back, then you know what those three letters meant. But I mean, you create however, um, however you want to write down in your notebook. The only person that needs to really understand what you're writing down is yourself. So yeah. as long as you know what you're uh, doing and you have it straight, I think that's really all that matters. Yeah, man, that's definitely something I totally missed out on. I mean, I remember hearing uh, maybe coaches or scouts or whoever you know kind of talking about the the concept the idea of writing writing stuff down but it was just something mm -hmm. i never i never even attempted never yeah. attempted um and just to think like what if i had some information on a guy that i face you know let's say i face him in summer ball and then i face him you know let's say in high school and i face him in the, in the section playoffs it's like wouldn't it be good to kind of remember maybe I do remember but or to have it actually a whole at bat at least with my thoughts of how I felt right. how he pitched me how I perceived his his movement the type of stuff that he had did he get me out on you know xyz uh did I get him you know if I if I hit a you know 450 foot home run off of him uh off of a fastball up in the zone probably not going to get a, you know, he's going to do his best to try and not give me a fastball because most pitchers will remember. <laughs> mm -hmm. They might yeah. not have to write down when you gave up a 450 foot bomb to somebody. Right. As a pitcher, you remember that stuff. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean, that's just absolutely huge. And a lot of it may not ever benefit you later. Uh, exactly. But it's the habit of it. Um, I think it, the benefit, if it doesn't actually play out into a game, um, is just is the your ability to perceive and to like to observe and to soak in information um, because mm -hmm. you get into the habit of you know that you have to write it down or that you're going to write it down um, so you you tend to soak up certain those things right and right. then boom, they, if they don't make it down on paper um, you still took them in um, so for you as a player, just especially as a catcher, like you got to be on top of your stuff. You got to know, right. the game. you have to be present. You cannot be thinking about your bat at bat. while <laughs> while you're trying, exactly. you know, trying to catch, uh, and dealing mm -hmm. with base runners and just the, the, I mean, I was never a catcher, but I have a lot of respect for you guys. Cause it's a, it's a tough position. Um, but yeah, that was absolutely huge writing stuff down. I started to do it in my personal life. Mm -hmm. habit I have it's been tough to get it to stick um, but I always like keep resorting back to it and it is um, very helpful and beneficial and um, definitely just a good habit all-around habit for sure and kind of going off of to beating what the game presents to you I think it, it's big to, to just understand writing things down like I don't read everything I write down back again. Like I'll, yeah. after I write something down, I'll let two, three days go by and then I'll go back over them. And again, I'll do this with everything. Like I'll, I'm, I listen to a lot of podcasts. I'll watch videos, stuff like that. Where something I see on Twitter or something like that. And I'll take notes on them, but I'll take the notes. I'll wait a little bit. It can be like every Sunday or Saturday where you look back over all the notes you took and you underline star, however you want to mark them, the key points that you can really take so that you don't have to go through the five pages of notes you took each week. You can just look at, Oh, these six bullet points that I took out of this week that are really going to help me out. Now, if you're trying to digest a whole month, now you only have 20, 24 bullet points instead of having to read 30 pages. And that's a yeah. big thing that, that I think is big because it helps you digest it 
and none of us are going to be reading through 30 pages of notes no. to, to, I mean, let's be honest, like <laughs> nobody's going to really go back through all those notes. But if you have a more condensed kind of uh, spark notes or cliff notes of the notes you took and of everything you're, you're processing, it's much better so that you can have a condensed version that you can take with you to wherever you're going. So that, yeah. that's another big thing with taking notes is going back to them and understanding what the key points are. Maybe even another tip too for, for guys listening is like you can consider um, maybe you're not allowed to have your phone out during a game, but you could always mm -hmm. buy one of those little um, uh, uh, audio recorders. Right. I'm sure they have newer updated ones nowadays that aren't as old fashioned, but they could probably upload to your phone or something um, because that might be better for some people than mm -hmm. writing down just depending on how yeah. people learn or how they they process is to be able to go in your bag grab your little audio recorder or even if your coach is cool with you pulling your phone out and using a recording app and just talk into it make your notes that way um, maybe it's that. a little maybe it's a little quicker and it's a tip um, mm -hmm. for, player, for guys that are playing yeah i think that's a great idea um, because obviously we can speak much faster i mean if we tried to write yeah. down everything we were saying during this podcast to take us hours um, but speaking is much quicker and yeah, that's actually, I might even have to tinker yeah. around with is maybe even recording a little bit. And then when I get, they, once I get home, then, then you take the time to write it all down. Um, so yeah, I, I think that's definitely a great idea to, to write everything down. 